Hi everyone. Tonight's video is on the electron transport chain. And this is the last video in a series of videos on cellular respiration. Before you watch this video, you should have either covered in class or watched the videos on glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. I should note that I don't have my camera on for this video because there's a lot of information on these slides and I find that the camera is actually blocking some of the information that I want to show in this video. So the electron transport chain is the final phase of cellular respiration. It's also called oxidative phosphorylation, but I'm going to stick with the term electron transport chain because I think it's more explanatory. This is where the majority of the ATP is made in the cellular respiration process. If you assume that 36 ATP are made for every glucose molecule, 32 of those ATP are made in the electron transport chain. Usually there is a range of ATPs given that are made for every glucose molecule. And this is because the process is so indirect that depending on the conditions, there can be a different amount of ATPs made for different glucose molecules. So the electron transport chain is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that's indicated here in this picture of a mitochondria with this dark orange line. So let's look at things a little more closely. We have covered glycolysis that occurs in the cytoplasm and the Krebs cycle that occurs in the mitochondrial matrix in previous videos. So after glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, all the carbons from the original glucose have been released and exhaled as carbon dioxide. The energy in glucose was in the electrons and NADH and FADH2 are now holding on to a total of 24 electrons for each original glucose. That's 10 NADH and two FADH2, with each one holding on to two electrons. These electrons were picked up from the glucose and the breakdown products of glucose in a series of reactions in both glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, although the majority of these electrons were picked up by NAD and FAD in the Krebs cycle. NADH and FADH2 will now bring these electrons to the electron transport chain, which is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and I've circled it here in green. This is the larger view of the electron transport chain that we are now going to cover in detail. So I wanna orient you to what I'm showing you in this slide. So looking at this whole mitochondria here, I am just showing this small section circled in black that shows a small part of the matrix, a small part of the inner membrane, intermembrane space, and outer membrane. So I've got the cytoplasm out here. This phospholipid bilayer represents the outer mitochondrial membrane. This space between membranes is the intermembrane space. And then this phospholipid bilayer is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Finally, we have the matrix or innermost space of the mitochondria represented here. There is a series of proteins called electron carriers that are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane or the Christi is another term for this inner mitochondrial membrane. These proteins comprise the electron transport chain. I've indicated them here with these kind of white blobs embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. These proteins are electron carriers. They are capable of accepting and donating electrons. There's one more protein embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and that is called ATP synthase. You should know from the ending in ASE that this is, of course, an enzyme. And the name of this enzyme, ATP synthase, tells you that there's something involved with ATP synthesis here. So let's begin our process. NADH and FADH2 bring their electrons from the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain, and they're going to drop off those electrons to these electron carriers. The electron carriers in the electron transport chain are very electronegative. So the electrons move willingly from NADH and FADH2 to these electron carriers. That regenerates NAD plus and FAD, which will then go back to the Krebs cycle to pick up more electrons from the next glucose coming down the pipeline from glycolysis through the Krebs cycle. These electrons are then going to move down the electron transport chain. And I always think of it as kind of a bump, bitty, bump, bitty, bump, bitty, bump kind of pathway. Each one of these electron carriers is slightly more electronegative than the previous one. So the electrons move spontaneously from one complex to the next 
Each complex is only able to receive electrons when it's passed off its electron to the next complex. So this complex, this electron can only move to this complex when this electron has already moved on. This process does not require energy because the electrons move to the more and more and more electronegative complexes in this electron transport chain. And not only does it not require energy, it releases energy, and that energy is used to pump hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. And with multiple glucoses being broken down, eventually what you get is a lot of hydrogens being pumped into this intermembrane space. This forms a concentration gradient. We have a high concentration of hydrogens in the intermembrane space and a low concentration of hydrogens in the mitochondrial matrix. Now, the inner mitochondrial membrane and the outer mitochondrial membrane are both impermeable to hydrogen. The hydrogens cannot get out of the mitochondria, nor can they re-enter the mitochondrial matrix by going through either of these membranes. The only way the hydrogen can go down the concentration gradient back into the mitochondrial matrix is through this enzyme called ATP synthase. This is a form of facilitated transport because the hydrogen is going from a high concentration to a low concentration through a transport protein. When the hydrogens go through this ATP synthase molecule, it actually makes the ATP synthase spin. And this spinning, this energy of motion, allows a phosphate to be added to an ATP to make ATP. And in fact, every hydrogen that goes through this ATP synthase allows for a lot of ATP to be made. So this is how the electrons and glucose are used to put the phosphate back on ADP to make ATP. The electrons are dropped off in the electron transport chain, which bumps them down to increasingly electronegative complexes in the chain. That releases energy and allows hydrogens to get pumped into the intermembrane space, forming a hydrogen gradient. The hydrogen gradient is then used as the energy to make the ATP synthase spin and that allows the phosphate to be put back on the ADP to make ATP. That's a lot of information, but we still have one more concept to cover. This final electron carrier is holding on to an electron. It can't accept an electron from the previous carrier until it gets rid of this electron. That is finally the role of oxygen in this process. Oxygen is very electronegative. It's going to pick up this electron from the final electron carrier in the electron transport chain. When it picks up that electron, that would make it negatively charged. So it also picks up a hydrogen from the mitochondrial matrix to form water. So oxygen is what we call the terminal or final electron acceptor in this process. It picks up the electrons from the final electron uh, acceptor in the electron transport chain, forming water in the process. So where is the energy at each step of this process? Well, the energy in glucose is in the electrons, which are very loosely held in those carbon-hydrogen bonds. Those electrons get picked up by NAD and FAD to form NADH and FADH2. And then those electrons are dropped off in the electron transport chain, and the energy of bumping them down the electron transport chain is used to form a hydrogen gradient, which is a form of potential energy. That hydrogen gradient is then the energy that is used to make the ATP synthase spin. And that spinning is what allows the ADP to put a phosphate back on to form ATP. So the energy has gone from being in the electrons and glucose to the electrons being held onto by NADH and FADH2 to the hydrogen gradient to the ATP synthase, finally to the ATP. This is a very indirect process. And that's why we always give a range of ATPs made for each glucose. I want to cover some common misconceptions and mistakes that I see students make every year. I see this phrase written on tests and quizzes every year in biology. Water picks up the electron at the end of the electron transport chain, and this is incorrect. Oxygen picks up the electron, and it picks up hydrogen at the same time, and that forms water. So oxygen picks up the electron and then the product is water. Water does not pick up that electron. 
Another thing students often confuse is they assume that the ATP synthase is part of the electron transport chain, and it's not. The ATP synthase is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, but it's not a part of the electron transport chain. And then students often get the direction and the mechanism of hydrogen movement wrong. The correct direction and mechanism is written here. Hydrogen is pumped from the inner membrane space into the intermembrane space from the matrix. This is a form of active transport because we're going from a low concentration to a high concentration, forming a concentration gradient. So it's pumped from the intermembrane space, I'm sorry, to the intermembrane space, here I am making the mistakes, from the matrix. Hydrogen then flows down the concentration gradient from the intermembrane space through the ATC synthase into the matrix. This is a form of facilitated transport because hydrogen is going from a high concentration to a low concentration through a transport protein. So we're pumping into the intermembrane space and we're flowing down into the matrix. So what you should know from both this video and the two previous videos on glycolysis and the Krebs cycle is the relative amounts of ATP made in each phase, a little or a lot. You should know the relative amounts of NADH made in each phase, and you should know the cellular location of each phase. And then you should know the role, the location in the cell, and which cell, which phase of cellular respiration each of these components is either used in or produced. So glucose is used in glycolysis, and it is the energy source, and it's in the cytoplasm. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It picks up the electron from the electron transport chain, forming water. Water is formed by oxygen when it picks up that electron in the electron transport chain. NAD and FAD pick up the electrons in both glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle. The majority of it, though, is done in the Krebs cycle. That forms NADH and FADH2. NADH and FADH2 then bring those electrons to the electron transport chain. You should know where the majority of carbon dioxide is produced. You should understand the role of the hydrogen gradient. How is it formed and how is it used to power the ATP synthase? And then you should know the role of the ATP synthase in producing the ATP. There's a lot of information in this video, so I think it would be a good idea to replay this video at least once to be sure you understand this very complicated process. So that's all for tonight.